director of a local Sufi organization, the Free Spiritual Center. What's been unique about this initiative is that it started off from one point of looking at expression of sound from Sufis and shape note singers, and it's looked at the history of the mill, the people who worked there, what the mill is going to become as a new space for the community. It's brought something fresh and something different. Exploration of cohesion within a vision of artistic expression hasn't really happened before. So it's been very refreshing and when we, in our experience, when we've approached communities, they have welcomed the opportunity as well to get involved. In this project, there are many tensions that we are attempting to address. This is one of the most economically depressed areas of England. And the closure of the mills represents a kind of deep injustice that has been done to the working class through globalization. It's left in its wake a form of devastation that is only growing wider. It's evident everywhere that the economy of the world is becoming more and more bifurcated. There are more rich and there are more poor. Those people participating are going to have the shape notes on this side of the circle. Susie, on this side. My name is Julian Evans. I'm a composer, musician, and choral director. I've been working with Jen and Hasnain on some of the fusion music. My name is Jennifer Reed. I'm the preeminent broadside balladress of the Manchester region. I sing 19th century work songs, specifically from Manchester. My name is Hasnain Hanif. I'm from Briarfield. I'm a Nasheed artist, which is a form of singing, praising the Prophet, peace be upon him. It's a form of music or poetry focusing on religion and the South Asian culture. So we've been coming up with ideas that make journeys using a shape note song, a mill song, and a Nasheed. North Light Mill witnessed a lot of transitions over the whole time it was open. People from here, British people from maybe the early 20th century would work there. And then in the 1960s, you've got the Pakistani economic migrants that would come over then to work in the same mill. I'm a Muslim, British born and bred, born and bred here in Bryfield, and my existence is because of this mill. My grandma and granddad came here, my father came here, they worked at this mill and I'm the product of that mill. This project's all about integration, bringing the societies, different societies, different communities together. And I think this fusion that we're creating here is a live example of that because it's three different people coming from three different ethnicities, it's three different backgrounds. But if we can make one song, one fusion, which is just so simple and beautiful, then it should be an example for all of us in our community. The People of Pendle and the artist Suzanne Lacey. A film of the event is due out next year. Suzanne Lacey first came to prominence in California in the 1970s as part of the feminist avant-garde of artists. She's among those featured in a new exhibition of feminist art at the Photographer's Gallery in London. The show is a fascinating reminder of the energetic and witty politics of the 1970s art movement, not a hint of the sourness often falsely attributed to the feminist movement. Many of the works challenge taboos, like the imagery of female genitalia, but there's especially much on the status of women through marriage, appearance and age. I went round the exhibition with art historian Professor Hilary Robinson and the artist Lynn Hirschman Leeson, who lived in a created persona of a young secretary, Roberta Brightmore. You'll hear first, though, Suzanne Lacey's 1978 film, In Mourning and in Rage, when a group of women artists protested in red and black robes outside Los Angeles City Hall at police failure to catch a serial killer. I am here for the rage of all women. The 60s and 70s were times of revolution. I am here for women fighting back. It was just after the free speech movement, and I think women were just 
trying to find their voice, realizing that they had no history, that there was no reference for them in any of the books, and just trying to find their own place in culture and in society and inventing ways to get noticed. And one thing that feminism is about is that women really were using the uh, issues of that time, the issues of sexual violence, the issues of rape, of women being murdered, and creating work that put that out through the media to the public. Well, we're standing in front of several of your works, and in the series you constructed this identity of a woman you named Roberta Brightmore. You lived a life of four years. It's actually almost ten years. <laughs> yeah, it really took that long to flesh her out, to have substantial adventures for her, to get her handwriting, her voice, her psychiatric reports. All those things took time. And real bank accounts and all the documentation. She was to all intents and purposes, a real person. She was able to get a credit card, and I, I couldn't, as I had bad credit and she had no credit. So. <laughs> it's really exposing the personal and turning it into the political. And that gap between the sort of the sold glamour of the life of the young working woman and the reality of it. Mm -hmm. This is an analysis. This isn't Lynn acting out, or it's not an alter ego, or it's not some kind of essential part of herself that she's trying to uncover. This is her analyzing what a very ordinary young woman's life would be like. And the one that we're standing in front of here with the makeup. This is constructing uh, Roberta Brightmore. Yes, the photograph is of Lynn wearing the Roberta Brightmore wig with the makeup on that Roberta Brightmore would have worn. And it's laid out as if it were a painting by numbers. It's a guide to how to be this kind of young woman. And of course it has this sort of almost a drag queen look about it, the, the artifice of constructing a young woman. Yeah, well, it was San Francisco. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, in the corner, there, is, yes. there are these exquisite photographs of a vulva brought up bigger and bigger. And I never see stuff like this in art galleries <laughs> even now. Tell me about that. OK, well, this is um, Suzanne Santoro. She's um, used a certain kind of aesthetic that's very minimalist. It's photographic, and you see the genitals usually um, against a white, a white background. She made a book called Towards New Expression, where she was taking these photographs and then finding equivalents for them in nature and in culture. So flowers, shells, the fabrics on Greek sculptures. And it was selected for an artist book exhibition by the Arts Council, and there were complaints about it, and the book was then censored from the exhibition. While they left in an artist's book by Alan Jones, and all of his work is drawn from hardcore fetish porn imagery, basically. But he was supposed to have aestheticized it, whereas Suzanne's work was deemed to be pornographic because the actual title of the book was Urging You to Take Action. Nine feminine activists have been acquitted over a topless protest at Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris last year. I was going to ask particularly about what you make of where feminist art is today and people mm. talk about younger artists mm. and groups like Femin which have quite a controversial reputation. They've been accused of degrading a place of worship as they celebrated former Pope Benedict's resignation. That scene is more of a stunt organisation and certainly I, my understanding is that it's a man who organises them. I think it's really important to think of feminism as a set of politics that is intersecting with art here. You know, when you talk about feminist art, it's not a style, it's not a medium, it's not like other forms of categorization in art history. Groups like Femen are, are interesting because they are first and foremost a protest group. But what they are doing is using some of the aspects of the art world to make their protests. And I think it's very interesting if you try and work out where is the link between activism and actively being an artist. So if we look at Suzanne Lacey's work about the rape cases in that were happening, in Mourning and in Rage, yes. They were getting together to make a really visually stunning performance out on the street, very publicly, but they also timed it so it would be court for the evening television news. Ten actresses dressed in black to symbolize the grief for the ten women who have recently been found raped and strangled. Because they were talking about police ignoring this, this appalling series of murder rapes. I am here 
for the 388 women who have been raped in Los Angeles. And you're right in that it's art, because when you see them in the protest, they're dressed like they're out of a kind of Lorca play in these black and red robes. I mean, it, it is clearly a work yeah. of art, but mm. taking place on the evening news about yeah. this terrible set of crimes. Exactly. So it expands the place that art can take place, you know, where you see it. It's not just in a gallery. It's not just in a museum. It really impacts and intercepts all of our life, and particularly through the media that's so accessible and so vital in creating images. I talk to young women, and they don't know that they've come farther than we did. They have no idea how tough it was in the 70s to be seen. However, at the same time, the, what we thought was the hypersexualization of women's bodies in pornography and the media and film and so on has now increased so much. Is there a, any young artist today that you particularly watch or, or consider a, a feminist artist? Tanya Ostojic. Um, Serbian artist who deals with issues of migration. She did a piece called Looking for a Husband with an EU Passport, where she actually did find somebody to marry because women in Eastern Europe are putting themselves onto websites looking for husbands to get out of the situations that they're in. And, of course, they become then very vulnerable to total exploitation, sex, sex work, sex trafficking, exactly, and domestic slavery. And um, Tanya Ostojic is really exposing a lot of the abuses that go on because of these arbitrary borders that we, we set up between what we like to call nation-states. Professor Hilary Robinson and Lynn Hirschman Leeson. And feminist avant garde of the 1970s is at the Photographers Gallery in London, opens this Friday and runs until mid January. The death of the conductor and violinist Sir Neville Mariner was announced yesterday. He founded one of the world's leading chamber orchestras, the Academy of St Martin in the Fields, and his soundtrack to the 1984 Oscar-winning film Amadeus sold over six million copies. Two years ago, when he became the oldest conductor to lead at the proms at the age of 90, we asked him how his conducting style had changed over time. <laughs> There's a, an early video of me conducting and it looks like the most self-conscious youth, sort of uh, not quite knowing where to put his, either his arms or his mouth, you know. If you've been playing the violin as I had, you have certain physical movements which come fairly naturally. But uh, presenting yourself to, to a bunch of professional musicians is quite tricky if you're young. And uh, being able to be useful to them is, is something you have to learn very quickly. I think Pierre Monteux came to one of our concerts when I was leading the orchestra and waving my bow. And uh, he said, that was really good music, but uh, why don't you stand up and conduct like a man? And I said, well, you know, it never occurred to me, really. He said, well, come to my school. So I went to his school and there was Andre Previn was there and David Zinman, and that was the beginning. And once you pick up the battle, it's very difficult to put it down again. So Neville Mariner, who died yesterday, and you can hear the rest of that interview on our website. Tomorrow, Front Row comes live from the Radio Theatre for the announcement of the winner of the BBC National Short Story Award. Do join John at 7.15.